this special chat show, a topic dedicated to immense significance in our rapidly evolving digital landscape, the India Digital Personal Protection Act. I'm delighted to be your host today. And as we embark on a thoughtful and engaging exploration of the implication, challenges, and promises that this landmark legislation holds for individuals, business, and broader society. In a world where data is often referred to as a new currency, the importance of safeguarding personal information has never been more critical. India, with this ever-expanding digital landscape and a massive population that is increasingly interconnected, it has taken a significant step towards ensuring the privacy and protection of a citizen through the introduction of this Privacy Act. India is definitely on the global spotlight. As we dive into our conversation today, we aim to unravel the layers of this legislation, understanding its nuances and exploring the potential impact it might have on our lives, businesses and the very fabric of our digital society. As we engage in this dialogue, we also want to contemplate uh, the balance between the societal and economical ramification. How does it alter the landscape for businesses? How does it empower individuals in the digital age? And importantly, how does it position India on the global stage concerning data protection? Our esteemed panelists today are industry practitioners who will guide us through these questions and help us navigate the path forward. I encourage the audience to actively participate in this conversation. Your questions and insights are invaluable for us to collectively endeavor to understand the implications of India Privacy Act. So without further ado, let us embark on this enlightening journey and a chat on India Privacy Act. So before we begin, let me introduce to our uh, distinguished panelists to begin with uh, Mr. Bharatwaj Ramaratnam, who is the head of risk reliance Nippo Life Insurance. He comes with 25 years of experience in banking and life insurance industry across South Asia, Middle East and India. His expertise is in designing, delivering innovative financial and non-financial risk mitigation strategies and facilitating change through redesign of internal operating and business process strategies. The next is Mr. Javed Sheikh, who is a professional with 23 years of experience overseeing multiple industries, including banking, insurance, telecom, and travel. Currently holding the position of Vice President of Risk and Compliance at Teleperformance India, his experts lines in ensuring business operation within free risk uh, environments. Next, we have Sumi Sugumaran, who is the head of legal teleperformance India. She comes with nine years of experience as an in-house counsel specializing in contractual obligation, negotiating uh, intellectual property rights and implementing co contractual protection for work at home. Next, we have Mr. Daryl Pereira, who's a compliance specialist with 18 years of experience. He's been an advocate for protecting business processes by implementing meticulous compliance and risk management strategies. His main focus is ensuring alignment and adherence to client requirements within process. Before jumping into the questions, I wanted to introduce myself to I am Sindhu Shaji Betori, working as a senior director in Protivity, aligned with internal audit and financial advisory services. I come with 20 plus years of experience and I take care of clients' engagements pertaining to cyber strategy and governance, data privacy and protection. So this is my expertise. And today we are talking about Privacy Act and as part of our day-to-day -day, uh, engagement with clients, we've been having a lot of conversations since this act has come out. Uh, we've been conducting a lot of workshops with our clients across various sectors and there has been certain common concerns and certain common queries that we all have been discussing, deliberating on how to address them. So some of those questions I'm going to bring up today. So the first question is over to you, Javed. How can organizations navigate the regulatory landscape and adopt best practices to meet the Act's requirement? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sindhu. Uh, uh, but before that, uh, what is the count now of the participants, Sindhu? Uh, Satish, uh, how many? Yeah, uh, we have 
crossed about 140 participants oh, now. So yeah. Uh, firstly, good evening to all the 140 participants and to my co-panelist. Uh, uh, very good evening. Uh, yeah. Uh, on your questions with regards to question with regards to uh, uh, how can organization navigate the uh, regulatory landscape, uh, I, I speak uh, with an assumption that the people who are participating have an overview of DPDPA, and uh, uh, we will not get into the technicalities or the the, the specifics of uh, the terms being used. Uh, the best practices which uh, can be used or the straight easy answer to your question can be that you need to understand DPDP Act, uh, identify and classify personal data, develop and implement data privacy policy and procedure, obtain consent, appoint a DPO, provide data subject with access to the personal data, so on and so forth. But all, all this is, yes, it is basic and basic is always important. Having said that, uh, when we look at the landscape, there are too many privacy laws across the globe. And for an organization to understand what compliance requirements are, they require to follow and then sort uh, of create a common minimum baseline. Now, how do we do that? To review and assess all privacy law across the globe, it's a humongous task. And it will take time. So implementation of any privacy law, we will have to start with data mapping exercise. Now, when we say data mapping exercise, we there is always a starting point that we identify our data, prepare a record of what is what is data that we are collecting, how you use it, and so on and so forth. This will give an overview of the data being handled, uh, data handling practices, and the and also justify the data processing activity. Uh, though it sounds easy, it is not. For a smaller organization, it may probably take lesser number of days or months, but for a large, huge organization, in our case, we will we will we'll have to at least dedicate a, a time of around one year. So for, for to, uh, to achieve this, we'll have to create a task work within our organization. We'll have to be very meticulous. We'll have to, we'll, we'll have to do it in such a way that people do not feel uh, loaded with work while they're action happens so that is that is a uh, planning which we will have to do we'll have to also identify uh, roles whether we are a data fiduciary or a data processor this will help identify our obligation under the law uh, while we are doing this we'll have to also identify which market or region we are catering to because basis that we will have to understand the nuances and we'll have to apply the various uh, 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 compliance or privacy uh, laws. Uh, last, uh, we will have to, of course, review the law applicable to the region and uh, customize our compliance requirement. Uh, a common minimum baseline uh, compliance requirement will have to be uh, uh, created, defined, is something which I am repeating, but that is, that is something which we will, at this stage, have to keep it simple and approach because we are at the stage where things are unfolding. We are coming to know a lot of new things as we go. So we'll have to keep ourselves open, as they say, and we'll have to go in that direction. So <laughs> absolutely, side. absolutely. Well said, uh, Javed. And uh, as rightly put across, uh, there are certain fundamental aspects of data privacy and data protection that every organization has to take it. And they're more or less the same across the world. It is not something very specific to our country, right? If you take care of our fundamentals, you are by and large sorted out. People are more concerned about superficial things and, you know, about tools and everything. But I think data, that's the starting point. Do we know what kind of data we hold as an organization? Do we know the multiple entry points? Do we know the multiple exit points? Where are the data traversing in our entire ecosystem? I think even that awareness level exists, then half of your problem is solved, right? So I totally agree with you, Javed. Thank you so much. Um, Bharat Smarj, over to you. What strategies can business adopt to thrive in a privacy conscious environment while still leveraging data for innovation? I mean, this is one of the biggest question for everyone. Everybody's so keen in innovating, you know, and they want to do digital transformation. 
to balance both privacy and innovation, okay. that is a question mark. And every time businesses, we want to scale the Mount Everest and, you know, and there is somebody in the organization, no, no, please come down. You know, So this is a difficult challenge. So how do you think we can address this concern? Thanks for the opportunity, Sindhu and Protivity. And uh, good evening, good afternoon uh, to all the participants and to the co-panelists. Um, it's a very interesting point that you've raised uh, because every time a new regulation comes, of course, yeah, now we're talking about data privacy. Uh, I know way back, 20, 25 years back, there was a try that came up with so many other things. Like what you said, business was scaling at like 100, 200 kilometers per hour and somebody just came and said, hey, you know what, stop. You need to do something else. Yeah, but having said that, um, given that GDPR came first, right, and many countries kind of used GDPR as a lessons learned, while GDPR is still they consider themselves as the golden rule of privacy and all that. But I think many uh, countries and the uh, people responsible for drafting such frameworks kind of identified what were the difficulties that the countries went through, especially the EU's, EU countries went through when uh, GDPR came with this most purest form and some of the challenges. And I think the Indian government has taken that as a cue when they were drafting this. Um, it may not be as very stringent as what uh, the GDPR is, the new DPDP Act. But having said that, uh, it gives a lot more opportunity in terms of openness to uh, do that. So from a business standpoint, I think maybe three, couple of three, four points that I thought would help in strategy is, I think one of the things which is different from GDPR to DPDP is that our Indian DPDP Act is only concerned about digital data as of now it is still leaving out a lot of data that is not in the digital form or not there as a non-private identifiable data. I think there's a lot of opportunity for businesses to look at that pool of information and see how that can help in their business strategy. Uh, combine it maybe or a cross tab kind of a thing with the uh, private identifiable data and see how they can come up with their own strategy in terms of targeting customers, right products and all that. That could be one of the ways. The second point, which is again coming uh, by the act itself is called privacy by design. So when we write processes today, when we do processes or when we do risks and controls, uh, we now, all businesses will now have to start considering privacy and all its elements into the design itself. Uh, there is no question of stating that, you know what, let's just write what we want. At the time of execution, let's see how much of privacy we can kind of manage. So no, the design itself should carry the privacy element. So privacy by design should be part of the business strategy. And of course, the third one is the improving transparency part of it. Now the transparency is to the customer. And like what you said in the opening statement, this act is not just impacting the corporates or the environment per se, it is an individual impact as well. Every single person will now be not just be uh, what to say aware or responsible, they will know where their data is going and what can be done with that. So it is from a strategy standpoint, what businesses should do is how are they going to improve the transparency of how the data is going to be used. And that is going to be a lot more important because that's where the come the customer then gets the confidence with whom they are dealing with as a corporate. And I think one of the last points, uh, of course, there are many, uh, like what you said, the business strategy can be a workshop that can be done for at least two, three days. But one of the core elements that I think which we should, as uh, the companies and businesses should look at is investments, where they are going to invest. Of course, there are going to be systems and tools, but I think it's very important, like what Javed mentioned in the beginning, one of the requirements of uh, the act is to set up a data prevention officer. Now that's a new talent, uh, right? I'm going to, Maybe we'll have some opportunity to talk about it during the conversation later as I mean, if something contextual comes up, but it is not just the systems and tools we're talking about. We are going to invest in a lot in terms of people. So there is roles that you need to define. There are responsibilities you need to define and there are people who are going to manage this data as well. So I think if these four on kind of looks into the customers, employees, shareholders, kind of a Venn diagram, then all this will need to be revisited in terms of the overall business strategy and then plug it in to take it forward from there with the customers. Right. 
Thank you so much, Bharatwaj. What a great perspective. And I'm sure this is going to be a good strategy for innovation and bringing balance between privacy and data protection. And I like the view when you mentioned privacy by design. That's the mantra going forward. I mean, there is no way it's going to be an option that, you know, at these stages is when I look at privacy. It has to be by design at all levels, at all operations. We need to increase the capability of our own uh, strength in terms of an organization to handle these kind of requirements. Uh, well said, Bharatwaj. You're right. The specifically pointing out to that, I was just reading somewhere on privacy by design that it is actually becoming an expectation now. Yeah. It's no more just a norm or a regulatory yeah. requirement. It's become a minimum expectation that privacy by design must be there. There is, right. you can't just get away with the fact anymore stating that, you know what, it is implied somewhere, it is implicit somewhere, <laughs> no, sorry. It's a minimum expectation. Now. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And that's the tone even said. So we do have the act now and we are waiting for the rule sets to be out. But the regulators, some of the global standards have already started talking in those lines. So yes, uh, the tone has already been set at the global footfront. I'm sure it's, it's a matter of time now. So Sumi, coming from a legal background, I have a very good question for you. How does India Privacy Act compare to the privacy regulations in other countries? What's been your experience? How does it compare to GDPR? As Bharat Bhatt really quoted that GDPR is considered as a global or the, and the glo golden uh, rule book for data privacy uh, and protection regulation. So what's been your experience? What's your view on that? How does we stand across the other country regulations? I think before we jump into the variations, um, it's actually important to understand the core principles of privacy remains the same all across. Yeah. Uh, now, what are these core principles? First one being uh, transparency, letting the data principle know how their data is being used, what sort of data is collected, and how they are stored. Uh, the second core principle being uh, purpose limitation. You use the data only for the purpose specified for which you've taken the consent. The third one being data minimization, only collecting data that is actually required by an organization to perform the services. The fourth one being um, storage limitation. We delete the data as soon as it is no longer required, or we only store it till the time it is actually required for performance of services or for the legitimate use for which we are processing. And the fifth one being security safeguard to ensure that the organization has implemented uh, information security measures. Now, all of these four principles remains the same across the various hundred privacy laws that are there on the globe. But what, what brings in the difference is the objective behind the implementation of the privacy law. As an example, for EU, um, the GDPR treats right to privacy as a fundamental human right uh, of the citizen. For US, on the other hand, historically, we've seen the, a lot more focus on business interest, business concerns, innovation is also promoted and boosted in uh, US. But in China, you'll see a heavy emphasis on state security. So the privacy laws in China have harsher restriction around storage of data within the Chinese border. So now coming into specification, a, a lot of people have asked me, uh, what are the differences between DPDPA compliance requirement and GDPR compliance requirement? If we as an organization are compliant with GDPR, does that mean that there is nothing for us to worry about and we will be 100% compliant with DPDPA? So uh, the straightforward answer is no, you still need to do your uh, assessment because there are differences. So coming into specifications in GDPR, uh, we have six grounds of uh, collecting and processing data. One of them being legitimate interest, which includes legitimate interest of business, vital interest of an individual, such as uh, medical emergency and uh, uh, US country as a whole safety. Uh, and each processing that the organization is doing needs to be justified against these six grounds that are listed in the GDPR. In DPDPA, the grounds looks very different. So in DPDPA, there are two uh, grounds of processing. One is processing based on consent. So which means you have to take consent of the data principle. You tell them by your, uh, by your processing their data, what is the need, they consent, and then you do the processing and all other provisions apply. 
The second is the uh, legitimate use. There are nine listed grounds in the DPDPA, uh, which is considered as legitimate use, which is similar to GDPR. But in DPDPA, the legitimate use ground is much narrower than GDPR. And hence, DPDPA is heavily reliant on consent because the legitimate use ground is, is narrower than the legitimate interest ground in GDPR. To give you an example, um, if you're processing data for, let's say, fraud prevention, debt recovery, or uh, credit score check in India under DPDPA, you will need to take a consent from the terror principles. But if you're doing the processing under GDPR, it will be considered as one of the grounds of processing and you don't necessarily need to take a consent. So that's that's overall how the DPDPA is more reliant, heavily reliant on consent. So any MNC that as of now is saying that we are GDPR compliant, there's nothing that we need to worry about. I would still suggest take a pause, reassess the grounds of processing that you have in your organization, and then see how you can realign them into GDPR. Uh, sorry, DPDPA. Now, if you compare Singapore and India, interestingly, India has an exception of uh, publicly available data where DPDPA is not applicable for any publicly available data. There's no restriction on business to process the publicly available data. You don't have to take consent or worry about individuals right or implement safety security measures for these publicly available data. Now, this exception is also there in Singapore, but the difference is that in Singapore, the exception is only till the time for procuring consent. So you don't need to necessarily procure consent for publicly available data, but all other security measures or other re compliance requirements that are there as per the law will continue to apply to this publicly available data. While in DPDPA, it's completely excluded. There's no compliance requirement for publicly available data. Now, let me take you to US. Now, if you compare uh, the California Act with the Indian Act. In California, there's a specific requirement around disclosure of selling and sharing a person's data. Uh, the organization will have to disclose to uh, an individual that they are going to share their data or sell their data to a third party. And the individual has a right to opt out to say that I don't want my data to be shared. Now, those kind of provision are not there in DPDPA, maybe in future as we evolve as, as the enactment goes, maybe we will see uh, some of these uh, requirements as well. But bottom line be uh, that under each law, there are significant differences. So we should pause and not immediately assume compliance just because we are compliant with other privacy law. But already having understanding the nuances of privacy law from other jurisdiction and being compliant with those privacy laws will have a common, a basic data hygiene within the organization, which means then all you need to do is identify the differences and work towards those. So you're not starting from the scratch, but there is still some work that you need to do to be 100% compliant with DPDP. And, and as the rules are going to be published, we will get to know more. Uh, it's very interesting journey for me at least uh, so i'm really looking forward to the rules and seeing how everything is going to change thank you sumi you've given such a crisp overview and a comparison between various global uh, rules and regulation with respect to data privacy and i really caught on the word data minimization i really can have one whole session just on data minimization you know the more data you collect, your cost of compliance are going to skyrocket, you know, that is the kind of overhead that every organization carry. And fundamentally in India, we have been very um, relaxed on acquiring data from our data principles. We were like, give me everything, you know, and they're yeah, they, they, they sort of holders. <laughs> we might need it someday. So let me just store it. So that's been the culture here. And now I, I'm really looking forward to the rules and I want to see how India is going to react as in from the corporate side as to how are they going to collect data. Even for a layman, when you go for any services, the amount of data that's collected, now I'm sure that will be cut down. And so data minimization is one of the founding factor for an organization to traverse through this legislation. Otherwise, it's going to be extremely difficult, you know. So well pointed. I'm Really wonderful perspective shared. Thanks, Sumi. Over to you, Bharat Paj. Um, so what challenges do business and individuals foresee in complying with Privacy Act and how can these challenges be addressed? I mean, 
I know we are still in the nascent stage, but I'm sure you have some thoughts around it. So what do you think as a businessman and as an individual, what do you think will be the challenges that one will face with this act coming out in full force? Yeah, I think, yeah, Sumi was, took us kind of a global tour. Thanks for that. I made some important notes on that. And she very rightfully said, this act is still evolving, right? So in a way, it should say that the best is yet to come or the worst is yet to come. I don't know. So we'll have to wait and watch. But having said that, I think I would start with the kind of a nomenclature itself. Um, Kind of like what, how GDPR and DPDPA is being kind of interchanged and being used. I still find a lot of um, people getting kind of confused between data security and data privacy. I think the first challenge is people need to understand the difference. If I've secured my data, then am I DPDPA compliant? No, I think the biggest difference is security is about access to that data and privacy goes kind of steps even before that, even before you collect the data and sets the context. So that would be one kind of a big kind of thing for the businesses to understand and see how they are going to separate between the context and access. So that is something that they would be have to working on. <clears throat> Thankfully, uh, in a way, the control environment uh, kind of overlaps between the security world and the privacy world. So which means there is something that's already there. We don't have to start from zero scratch uh, from where we have to. Uh, then we'll have to look at a lot of these data driven business models today. Uh, I think yeah. like what you said, we've been holders of data, right? Okay, you buy, you take 10,000 data points along with it. If you get 50,000 more, it's okay. Just take it and keep it with you. Uh, we'll see maybe somewhere along the line, we'll get used with that. And those somewhere along the line have got into these business models, which are actually becoming, have become very critical to arrive at business decisions now. With data minimization, with data transparency and uh, privacy by design, these business models will have to be revisited again. So that is going to be a big challenge on what will have to be removed from these business models, then to arrive at the most calculated decision is the next step that what can uh, company should do. Then we're looking at, I think Javed raised a point in this first point itself as to where are you storing your data? Now the company could be in India, but where is the data, right? We are now talking about, let's say if it's a GDPR compliant company or if it's a GDPR compliant zone company, which a UK company that is operating in India. Now, what is their roles and responsibilities or their things coming on DPDP on them? Or even if you are within India, where are you storing your data if you're a multinational company? So data retention along with data storage. Data retention again, because I think the act very clearly states that if you don't need the data beyond a certain point in time, you should just go ahead and purge the data. Where are we purging the data today? Even in the IT act that came some, I think around 20 years back, there was a line which very clearly said that after the client exit, you have a very kind of limited period of time, which after which you need to purge the data. Today, we are not doing it anyway. Uh, just on a lighter note, more from a legal standpoint, we never know when a customer can file a case against you. Yeah. So which means then data is being held perpetually today. So that the data storage, data retention and data purging is going to be becoming very important. And of course, talent. Uh, today, data scientists, it's becoming the most talked about uh, knowledge, it's most talked about positions in the company everywhere. Now, data scientists are now primarily being used as in the fields of analytics, analysts and all that. Now, data prevention is a special skill set now. Now, I'm, where is the talent for data prevention now? Can compliance take over data prevention by themselves? Uh, I know a lot of companies who have already started appointing data prevention officers. How is the line of control going to be different between risk, compliance, the DPOs? Is it going to sit in the first line, second line? Uh, that's another line of question and thoughts that all of us should have. But having said that, uh, from a solutioning standpoint, uh, it's not the most optimal solution, but this is something that all of us have been doing anytime a new regulation comes. I think that's where people like IIA come into place to say, I think there is an important point that all of us should understand where we are today. Every company should have an assessment done to say, where is my company today against the requirements of the DPDPA? Now that can come in the form of an audit. 
right? I think that's where the audit firms are going to step up and they need to build their expertise there because an audit end to end across the company between all the business lines and functions to then come up and tell, hey, you know what? This is the percentage of compliance. Let's say on a scale of one to 10, you're on seven. Now, these are your gaps. And how are you going to resolve that? I think that is the biggest, uh, what to say, uh, investment a company should do in the next 12 to 15 months. Because like Sumi said, this act is going to evolve. And if you're going to wait for the next evolution to come in and then to understand where you are, I think it'll be a little too late. So I think the current impact assessment or a gap assessment needs to be carried out to figure out where we are. Um, and of course, there has to be enough awareness created within the organization and to the customer. I think these two will form an important role in meeting the challenges of the organization because then the organization will know where to prioritize, how much to prioritize, where to invest. Uh, I think once we do this, we'll at least know, okay, fine, from here to the next 12 months where I'm going to be. Yes, I agree. Thank you so much, Bharat Paj. I like the way you started off saying that data protection is not equals to data privacy, right? These are two different things. And that's where the fundamental disconnect is with many of the organization. They feel that they have all the controls in place for data protection and I'm sorted. I don't need to worry. I said that's where the <laughs> disconnect starts, right? So it's a very well pointed facts like I like the fact that you said data privacy awareness, protection awareness index have to now go up in every organization. You know, it's no more a responsibility of just the compliance department or the security officer or the enterprise risk team. You know, it is a collective responsibility. Everybody will have to work collaboratively to ensure that we are adhering to these requirements. It's no more a singular set of function that needs to be worried about it. Assessment, very, very important. That's your starting point. You know, you have to see where you stand against the act. You, unless you don't go through the sweeping of your entire operational activities, what kind of controls exist, do not exist, you will not even know how to bridge that gap, right? So I love that point. It's three takeaways, very good takeaways. Thank you so much, Bharat Baj, for that insight. Sumi, over to you. Um, how can the government and business collaborate to increase the public awareness? Exactly what Mr. Bharat was said, the awareness index have to go up. How can we, what can, what do you think that as an organization, as a government, we can do to create this awareness about privacy rights and what will happen if you're non-compliance to it? So, because it's not just about organization responsibility, even the data principles need to be aware of their entitlements and they should be cognizant about how data is being used and it is not at the stage of a breach that you should wake up to the fact that you know i have been exposed and i have been uh, invalidated so what what's your view on that yeah so thank you sindhu that that's a very important question um considering i'm from a legal background even though i know what laws are in india I know my right as a citizen, but a lot of people in India are still not aware. Um, there is a lot that the government is doing, but it's also important that big organization and, and MNCs or businesses come together, collaborate with the government to actually at least DPDPA implement that in such a fashion that everyone is aware of their individual rights. Now, there are various ways to collaborate with the government. There are various ways that the business uh, on their own can also spread awareness and I want to touch upon both of them. Um, I'll first, of course, answer your question on collaboration. So for collaboration, there, there are various ways that you can do it. You can collaborate with uh, civil society organizations to spread awareness. And historically, they have, they have a long standing history of working on privacy issues, uh, advocating for uh, individual rights. So you can see some sort of a collaboration with them along with the government. You can also work with the ministry to launch a public awareness campaign to educate people. You can use the social media uh, channels to do that public awareness campaign. You can also partner up with educational institution to actually teach the student, the young Indians about their privacy right, because if they are not aware, then the new generation that's coming in, we have to do it all over again. So you start from the the from young age you 
collaborate with educational institutions. You teach them about their privacy rights. And you obviously would have to develop a educational program along with the educational institution. You can provide guest speakers for uh, to take lectures in school and college and also sponsor students projects to the extent required. Um, now, coming to the business aspect of it, where business on or MNCs or organizations on their own can also play a vital role in increasing public awareness. Uh, the organization can promote awareness about privacy, safeguard, enabling trust within the workplace environment by empowering the culture of privacy. Now, one thing that we know and that we all of us have been talking about in India, there is no culture of privacy in India. Unfortunately, there's a culture of hoarding data, which we have to move away from. And we all know that better security and privacy behaviors at home will translate into better security and privacy practices at work. So whatever you do at home is the same personality. You come to office, you do the same at home. So if your personal rights, you know about them, you know how to how to protect them, what to do about them, you will have a better privacy culture in the organization. So basically do not limit the organizational level awareness session that you guys are gonna to do to just compliance requirement as an organization. Take it a step ahead, help your employees to understand their individual rights under DPDPA. Spread awareness sessions through privacy training, through, through um, you know, maybe, maybe celebrate a privacy week in your office with various interactive activities and for which would further help employees to understand in each various situation. What is it? What are their rights? What can they do? Who do they reach out to? And you can also provide various tools to the employees for them to actually prioritize privacy. I think that's exactly what we need to do as an organization, as an individual. Privacy has not been a priority for us ever. And now I think it's a time that you have to start putting that as priority over and above anything else. If that is through uh, compliance, through fear because of penalty, then so be it as per the DPDPA. But I think it's important that we inculcate a culture of privacy all, all across us. And you cannot build a culture in a controlled environment. All you can do is lay a foundation and the culture would organically grow as you lay that foundation. So once you build the foundation, I would suggest let your employees run with it, see how the culture is growing, the privacy culture. And obviously you would have some checkpoints where you'll engage with experts or you'll hire experts for employees to reach out to them for their privacy concern, not limited to just the compliance requirement of the organization, but maybe their individual privacy concern, somebody who can help them out with that. And, uh, just like tool for preventing privacy incident is critical for the organization, the tool that easily empower employees to report is also necessary. A lot of times we've seen that we know that there is a breach, but there's a fear of reporting. There's a fear of, you know, how do I admit that something like this happened? So, so we have to empower our employees to be able to speak up about it so that right things can be fixed, the breach can be remedied. So there are, these are some ways that you can increase the uh, public awareness as an organization and collaborating with government and to spread the privacy as a culture. Thank you, Sumi. Very well said. And I love the fact that we said the cultural shift. I think that's what even I'm hoping once the uh, authority of data privacy act is in place in India, it is definitely going to bring a huge cultural shift in India and the perception towards data holding, you know, from various organizations and how they look at data awareness session. There are, there are minuscule activities on data privacy awareness uh, and protection awareness. Like some of the NGOs are running certain sessions with schools and uh, colleges to make them aware of how they need to conduct themselves in social media, how they should not be sharing data with strangers. And because of the cyber crime, it was more stemmed from the cyber crime perspective. But I think uh, well pointed. I think corporates can definitely sponsor some of these events, some of these awareness program. It can be part of their CSR initiatives where they can reach out to colleges and schools and give that kind of public awareness. You know, so I think that's a very good suggestion. Uh, yes, cultural shift, not just for the country, but also for the organization uh, in terms of how they will perceive data privacy 
mm-hmm. how they need to start looking at uh, imbibing those principles in their day-to-day operations in their businesses so earlier bharat watch mentioned about privacy by design that is the go forward mantra there is no way you can address this requirement unless you have the principle of data privacy by design that's instrumental to ensure compliance instrumental to protect individual rights in, instrumental in going towards a matured way of handling businesses i think the, yes that's a go forward strategy uh just adding to that now we spoke about so many things that we have to do and it kind of sounds very overwhelming for the organization as a oh god i have to do this i have to do that so bharat what do you think this is going to impact innovation and growth for digital economy in india i mean what do you think i mean anybody who listens to this will say i might have shut down my business is it i don't think i'm game for doing so many things just for the act right so how do you think this is going to be perceived see if you ask me as an individual right basically i'm a very optimistic guy so let me come to the optimism part but where i think businesses are feeling facing the challenges today is this culture of hoarding right we have had so much of information with us and we could do whatever we want and now suddenly on the fantastic straight autobahn somebody has put a speed breaker now and said that slow down uh um, you need to do certain things and you need to take certain consent and you need to have certain rights or obligations before you do uh whatever your innovation you are going to do uh so that so i would say the targeted marketing as uh, the mantra that was happening till some time back um uh, i i was always thinking saying that is my camera on because i speak to my family about a particular holiday and in 5 minutes there is a trigger in my social media feed saying that hey you know what you should come to this destination and you look at my phone i said who's listening to me my camera is not on my phone is in the lock mode how are people getting to know that so which means then this targeted feed is going to become a little difficult uh from a innovation standpoint in terms of how could how can things be made simpler now that is going to be a big challenge for people because the complexity that is built around these four five conditions that sumi and you've been repeatedly speaking about is something that everybody should consider in everything that they do now but keeping the challenge aside as i said now is where the optimistic person in me kind of jumps up and says it's not the first time that businesses have come with certain challenges like this as yeah. i said in the beginning 20 years back uh, there came the dnd list people are thinking that oh my god the cost of no putting fleet on street is going to go so up because i cannot do telecalling no <laughs> we came across over that then came the it act cyber security then they said oh my god what is going to happen in that case we overcame that as well so i think it's a matter of time of people to understand really i think where the noise is coming is because the requirements have not been completely understood so sumi rightly said and i think javed also said in the beginning very rightly stating that we have been practicing privacy for quite some time now except for that there's been no regulation right i've been holding on to i know what to give to whom and when to give and for what it is just that now it has become an act yeah. and i'm saying that whoever is going to collect that information from me better specify to me what they're going to do yeah but the other point i'm seeing now as an opportunity here is like how when cyber security and financial crime were at the top as the risk so let's say 7 8 years back there were a lot of innovation in the way things could be managed uh automation and all that i see that next in the 2 to 3 years i'm going to see or i wish to see how the technology world or the fintech world or the startup world is going to embrace this as a requirement and come up with new products i think that's where i think the action is going to be uh i think the next uh, how is ai going to come into because ai is going to be hit very badly in terms of once this privacy requirements are coming in right because people say how will ai learn if i don't give him the if i'm not going to push the data into the ai systems these ai systems will not learn and if they do not learn how are they going to give me the right output that i'm desiring now so which means ai is the way ai was looking at this is all going through an evolution so the positive side that i look at this for me specifically is that i see a lot of products that are coming up i think what is also encouraging is that 
the pipeline of the next kind of line of regulations that are in pipeline by the regulators coming in, especially in India, uh, I am waiting to see uh, there is a digital act that is going to come through, right? It is just, it is now going to talk about storage of information. Then there is, I think there is going to be an act that is going to come in specifically on, um, uh, I think the telephone operators or in terms of how do you do telephone businesses. Now, what will happen over the next 12, 15 months is that DPDPA may not be looked at as silo. DPDPA may have to be looked at together as IT Act, DPDPA, Digital Act, and whatever that is going to come through. Now that will become a kind of environment by itself and everything will start kind of connecting with each other. So I'm pretty positive. Yes, there is going to be an impact. It's going to be a slowdown. We've hit a toll booth. We're going to pay the toll for some time. The line, the number of cars that have lined up in the toll booth is increasing. But it is just a question of somebody saying that, you know what, remove that manual guy who's writing the receipts. Let's just put that toll card and uh, people will start moving fast again. It's a slowdown. I don't think there is a stoppage anywhere. So I think that's my view in this case. Thank you, Bharat Paj. Uh, I really like uh, the points that you brought out. And I agree, uh, the future forward uh, in any business is about AI adoption. And we need to have a separate session on AI and balancing data privacy because AI is handicapped without data. And in order to enhance the customer experience, it's so important to have these automation as part of our business drivers, right? So there is no way that we can move forward uh, with our businesses unless we adopt AI tomorrow. It's, it's, it's almost there and it's just going to be a matter of time that is part of our lives and day-to-day -day lives as well as in corporate life. Yes, it brings back to the question AI cannot function without data, but then we want to increase the, uh, enhance the customer experience. How do I balance that, right? I mean, some of these principles that we discussed today is definitely going to help to strengthen those aspects of balancing act between data privacy and the technology innovation that we are talking about. And it's, and I'm sure there would be many more standards and rule sets that will come. And I also like the fact that how you said, how regulations are going to connect with each other. It's already on the onset, RBI, SEBI, already are working on data privacy. So it's not going to be a singular uh, regulatory body who's going to be responsible. Almost everybody's going to talk about data privacy. All the standards have started being refreshed. They're coming up with a revised version of how they want to imbibe the data privacy in principles. Uh, the regulators are working on separate circulars on ensuring that the industry is following the data privacy requirements. So it, there is a lot that's coming there and it's a matter of time. And of course, the intent is always to ensure protection of the data for the citizens, right? It is never a hindrance. That was never the intent of any act. It is more to do with ensuring the data of the data principles are protected, the citizens are protected. That's the only ask. So as long as we address that, I think privacy is definitely a way of life for us. So Darren, if, if, discussing... if I can just add one point to it, which oh. I may have missed out is that if not for anything, I think this is an opportunity for corporates to build the trust factor with the yes. customers. Yes. Right. I think that was missing before. And with if a company or a organization or a corporate or whatever entity, whoever we want to call it as, is able to kind of showcase to the customer that I'm handling your data the way I'm supposed to, and I'm not using it for any other purposes. I think that's where the trust factor comes up and that this is another opportunity rather than uh, negativity out here as part of the act is that this act actually gives an opportunity for companies to build the trust with the customers. Very well said. That will actually advocate the strength uh, of the relationship that the businesses have with their customers. You know, it is definitely going to add another layer to the relationship that it has. And then, wow, what a way of looking. It's an opportunity for businesses to look at strengthening the relationship, build that trust with the customers. Very well pointed, Bharat Vaj. I love that point of view. Yes, Daryl. So you've been focusing on data protection all the while in your entire experience. So what is your view about the privacy and how do you think this is going to um, add on to the data protection strategies that various companies has? Yeah. So as my co-parent said, uh, for example, so we uh, when she compared uh, regarding the awareness level. So yeah, there where the privacy notice would come into picture. So when we drafted the privacy notice, we need to be very careful how we draft it. Uh, 
the all the rights we mentioned there. So that's one of the important uh, areas that we need to focus. If, uh, the second one was where Bharatwaj talked about AI, where automated decisions is one of the most important point there, where various regulations they have a rule around that. So that also has a very important thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I think uh, uh, very well said, uh, Daryl. These are some of the founding principles for <laughs> our data protection yeah. and AI and uh, innovation cannot escape <laughs> that route, right? And it is part. Privacy notice well said because a lot of websites have privacy notices published without even understanding what goes behind it. And uh, they just felt it was a tick mark exercise that we need to have a privacy notice on our website. Let's just put it up and not realizing that it has a legal ramification in case of an eventuality. Now everybody is waking up, you know, using a lens to go through each and every word, apostrophe, comma, that's put up in privacy notice to ensure it aligns with what the company advocates, what's their thought process on data privacy is a very, very important thing. In fact, we have also asked all our customers to first go and relook at the privacy notice. It's a very, very important document. That's your starting point. That's the tone set by the organization as to how are you going to deal with data privacy in your organization, right? So that's definitely the starting point and well-pointed, Daryl. Thank you. Um, I think uh, I'll just take a pause here. We'll, we'll, let's look at the audience questions. Uh, Satish, do we have any queries posted by the audience? I'm not able to see any questions as well. Okay, so there's a question on what are compliance for RBI registered NBFC in India as per DPDP Act and what are the role of internal auditors in those compliance? So does anybody want to take it? You want to take it, Sumi, in terms of uh, what is a tone set by RBI with respect to uh, a DPDP Act? Yeah. Yeah, so, so essentially, uh, Long story short, we'll have to actually wait for the rules to be published. Um, there is a construct in the DPDPA that talks about the overall core privacy principles, but the actual compliance requirements and the rules are going to be uh, published by the government, uh, I'm assuming, in next 30 days. Uh, we see a lot of good progress through the discussions that have been uh, happening along with the government. Uh, it was communicated that I think in next 15 days, the data protection board is going to be established. And once that is done, uh, the rules are going to follow. So we will have to, unfortunately, wait for the rules to be uh, published to, to actually understand what each organization compliance requirement would be. In the meantime, this is the time that we do the prep work, like uh, Javed mentioned. We do the data mapping. We identify what data we have, why do we have it, how are we processing. That entire data inventory is what we should be creating at this time. And once we have the compliance requirements, then we identify and see what changes we need to make in the uh, on ground level processes to be complying with DPDPA. So we we have to wait for the rules. I agree. I agree. The rule set is yet to be out, but by and large, uh, most of the regulators have already given certain indication as to how they want their uh, banks or the industry to respond to these requirements. And I'm sure there would be wide circulars that will be published by the regulators once these rule sets are out, right? Okay, there is another question which uh, states that the new regulations and requirements shall be dealt by which department of large size of business companies like legal or finance or a CRO or internal audit department, which department shall be taken this ahead? Uh, Bharatwaj, you want to take that question? Yeah, I was going through that question and yeah, I've, it is no department. Every yeah. single employee on role, off role, contract, so much to the extent of even your third party outsourced guy is going to be made accountable for the data that they use and the data that is going to be shared. But yes, there would be, I'm expecting like how the government is set up a data protection board uh, that will oversee and give the guidelines and all that. I'm expecting the companies to set up a team of experts 
that would come from all walks of uh, the businesses and functions who are subject matter experts in the areas that they deal with because a CRO alone can't do this, a legal and compliance alone can't do this, neither can the business alone can do this. So there has to be a team that will be formed. So if I were to put it like this way, the responsibility um, could be given to that panel of the board that will take forward this for implementation. But the accountability is there with every single person of the organization. So the responsibility is there. Yes, you can give it to a 10, 15 member. You can give a project steering committee, project working committee. Overall, they will look at it, implement and all that. But the accountability lies with every single person of the organization, which has been the same way even when it came in the IT Act. Keeping the data secure is, again, every single employee's uh, accountability. I'm going to be very clear on the segregation between responsibility and accountability. The responsibility can be given to a committee, but the accountability will be there with every single employee. Right. Yeah, and right. if I may add, uh, Sindhu, just to simplify yes. this for everybody's understanding, this is not something which is limited to organizations. Uh, it starts at our home. This is something which will come in our lives. So, 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 yes. Uh, who is responsible? We all are in it together. And uh, what uh, or what role certain department who steers this plays? Probably similar to the role which you are playing today in this session where you are moderating this whole conversation so nobody gets off track and we kind of uh, achieve the objective. So yeah, yeah, that 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 is simply put. Yeah, thank you, Javed. Thank you, Bharatwaj. Well said. And yes, it's a collective responsibility. It's no more uh, a singular person, department, or a committee's responsibility or accountability. Well said. And as a citizen, we also need to be aware of our own uh, exposure levels, not just the organization's responsibility about securing data. Even as a layman, one has to think about what we're sharing, whom are we sharing with. So yes, the awareness index have to go up. But from an organization point of view, clearly it's a collective responsibility. Um, so there are some more questions, but we are closing uh, time. So what we'll do is we'll address these questions through our email. But thank you so much. We'll certainly come back. And I want to conclude this conversation. I want to say I've compelled to reflect on the depth of our discussion today, the wealth of perspectives shared by our esteemed panelists. The show has been more than just a discourse on legal frameworks and regulations. It's been a collective exploration of the delicate balance between privacy and progress, individual rights and society needs. The act stands as a testament today in India to the nation's commitment to secure the digital future of its citizens. In our conversations, we have touched upon the profound impact it has on the legislation, it has on the business innovation, most importantly, the lives of individuals in this interconnected age. Our panelist has provided us with invaluable uh, insights and into the nuances of the compliances, the challenges the organization face, the potential positive transformation that can arise from a more privacy-centric approach to technology and data usage. So in closing, let us carry forward the spirit of this conversation beyond this virtual walls. The act is not a conclusion, but a starting point, a foundation upon which we can build a more secure, ethical, and equitable digital future. It calls for continuous dialogue, collaboration, and a commitment from all stakeholders to uphold the principles of the privacy while fostering innovation and progress. Of course, we've been discussing at length how we need to balance between innovation and privacy. So I extend my heartfelt gratitude to each one of you uh, and the audience who have been participating very well. I see the questions are still coming up. We'll certainly get back to you over the email. We'll also send out uh, a note on uh, a write-up on what we've discussed, our thought process around it. And thank you for the enlightening journey through the nuances of the Indian Privacy Bill. Thank you so much. And until we meet again, goodbye and take a good care of yourself. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, everyone. See you. Thank you. Bye.